is on the line Which way you gonna fall In the
great unchanger. All I am, the King of glory and of grace. One in Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ, my Savior and my God. With Christ, my Savior. And Crashing all over my beliefs And in all sincerity, Lord, I want to be yours mm -hmm. So pull me out of this mess I'm in Cause I know I'm wondering Leave my soul back home again I've always been yours And this world may push, may pull But your love it never fails
On behalf of Longview Baptist Church, I welcome you to the worship of God today. I hope that everyone watching is healthy and well. I continue to miss our worship time here together in the sanctuary, but I'm so glad you have chosen to worship with us today. I hope you will find the service to be a blessing to you. If you are not a member or regular attendee of Longview Baptist, I extend a word of special greeting to you. We are glad that you have gathered with us virtually. If you have any questions or needs, please do not hesitate to call our office at 919-231-3747 and leave a message or email one of our staff ministers. Our email addresses can be found on our church website at longviewbaptist.org. I wanted to share one announcement with you this morning. On Sunday, October 25th at 5 p.m., we will host another courtyard gathering. The courtyard gathering provides us with an opportunity to gather safely in person for worship. We will begin our time together with a called business meeting. Again, we celebrate your presence with us as we worship God together. I invite you to prepare your minds and hearts to encounter God in this time of worship. Whoever said becoming a Christian leads to a life free from hardship and trouble was absolutely wrong. Following Jesus is no bed of roses. Since I encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, I've been jailed frequently, I've been beaten up more times than I can count, and I've been at death's door time after time. I've been shipwrecked three times. I've fended off robbers 
and I've struggled with foes. I've even been betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've had many a sleepless night, missed many a meal. And that's not the half of it. When you consider all the daily pressures and anxieties of the churches that I'm associated with. But I've also encountered the incredible work of God in, around, and through my life. I've even seen heavenly visions and heard inexpressible sounds that only angels can share. I can honestly say that my present sufferings are nothing in comparison to the glory that will be revealed to us. Yet there is something that that really bothers me. Actually, it it torments me from time to time. Like a handicap, it it keeps me in constant contact with my limitations. It, It reminds me that we live in an imperfect world. And there are even times when it it brings me shame. I call it my thorn in the flesh. This is not some small thorn on a rose stem. It's like a a sharp spear protruding out of a pit that has been set as a trap for the enemy, or, or perhaps more like a spear in the hand of an enemy soldier. You see, it, it, it tortures me. It even impales me from time to time. Now, I've been told that my words recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 are some of the most studied words in the history of the church. And that's because people are trying to define what my thorn in the flesh really was. Some claim that it's a a physical ailment like epilepsy or migraines or leprosy or the lingering effects of malaria. Some say it's partial blindness, hearing loss, stuttering, or my unsightly appearance. Because you know I've been stoned. I I have experienced the the lash of the Jews, the 39 lashes several times. I've even been beaten with Roman rods. Others claim that it's an uh, emotional or a mental ailment like anxiety or depression or bipolar disorder or PTSD. Others claim that it's a, a, a material type of ailment. Since I depend on the generosity of others to supplement my meager earnings from my tent making trade. Some claim that it's a type of positional ailment. Since I lost my standing in the Jewish community, I no longer have the power or the control or the authority that I once did. Some even say that it's a spiritual ailment, a a bad habit or a a sin that I just can't shake. And still, there are others that take literally that phrase that I use, a messenger from Satan, to say that I'm tormented by a demon or perhaps by one of my many opponents. I've been told that 18th century Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard said that the greatest influence of my thorn in the flesh is that it seems to have afforded an uncommonly favorable opportunity for everyone to become an interpreter of the Bible. (laughs) It seems that everyone wants to know what my thorn in the flesh was. But perhaps there's a reason I left my thorn in the flesh vague. Maybe, just maybe I I left it unclear so that future audiences could identify with my plight. 
For you see, we, we all have thorns in the flesh. We all have things that, that really bother us, things that torment us, handicaps that, that keep us in a constant touch with our, with our limitations, sufferings that remind us that we indeed live in an imperfect world. And they feel like sharp spears that torture and torment and even impale us from time to time. You see, my, my thorn in the flesh tormented me so much that I prayed to the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. In actuality, I prayed more than three times, but that number three symbolizes completeness and wholeness. It, it declares the, the amount of time that I prayed to the Lord about my suffering. Because you see, I was in constant and utter frustration and, and agony because of my thorn in the flesh. But you know what God's response was? My grace is sufficient for you. That, that's not the response I had hoped for. But as I wrestled with that, I, I, I began to understand. It, it took some time, but I began to comprehend what God was saying to me. You see, my, my thorn in the flesh, my tormenting weakness, deepened my recognition of Christ's power that resides in me. It, it led me to become more reliant on Christ's power that resides in me. It's the same power that resides in all who embrace Jesus. And so it eventually led me to proclaim something that sounds just like a paradox. When I am weak, I am strong. As strange as it may sound, my dark nights of the soul enabled me to embrace my weaknesses, my insults, my hardships, my persecutions, my difficulties. You see, I delight in my sufferings because my sufferings connect me to the sufferings of Christ. But those sufferings connect me also to the good news of resurrection, the good news of victory, the tormenting song of the messenger of Satan has been transformed into a lovely tune of God's amazing grace. You see, instead of a thorn in the flesh, it has become a beautiful rose. What about you? In the midst of the torment that you experience due to your thorn in the flesh, have you discovered that God's grace is gloriously sufficient? Good morning. So glad you've joined us in worship today. I ask you to sing with me this hymn entitled, His Grace is Sufficient for Me.
pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all the blessings and mercies you have bestowed upon us. Knowing that your love is never-ending and always forgiving is a comfort for those who believe and trust in you. You are the only hope for our world, and it is this we claim. We lift up those who are in need of physical and spiritual healing. Put your loving arms around them. Be with our community as we continue to face these difficult and trying times. Let this be a perfect time for all to reflect on who is in control. It is you, our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who gives us strength and courage to carry on. Make us humble, brave, and joyful in your will. All this, Father, we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, let nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor, keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between like pride or station, self or friend shall not intervene. Though it may cost me much tribulation, I am resolved that nothing between. Nothing between their many hard trials, though the whole world against me convene, watching with prayer and much self denial, I'll triumph at last with nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor, keep the way clear, let nothing be children's message. Good morning to all of you watching. I know I say it all the time, but I miss our children's times together here at church. Our Bible story today is about King Hezekiah, who was taught by Isaiah that you can always pray to God because he hears all of our prayers. Do you ever want to talk to God but are not sure what to say? There's so much going on in our world today. It may be hard to know where to start. Does that ever happen to you? Well, today I want to show you something that will help you when that happens. It will help you, help you remember what to pray for. It is called the five finger prayer. First, I want you to put your hands together in front of you as if you are praying. Keep your eyes open so that you can see your hands. You will notice that the closest finger to you is the thumb. 
Since it is the closest to you, the thumb reminds you to pray for those that are closest to you. Pray for your parents and your brothers or sisters or close family members. The next finger is called your index finger. It is used for pointing. Let this finger remind you to pray for those that point you in the right direction. Pray for your teachers at school, your Sunday school teacher, and your pastor. The next finger is the tallest finger. This finger reminds us to pray for our leaders. Pray for the president and other leaders in our government and those who are leaders in our city. The fourth finger is called the ring finger. Did you know that this is the weakest of all fingers? Just ask anyone who plays the piano and they will tell you that is true. Let this finger remind you to pray for those who are sick. The next finger, the last finger, is the smallest finger. The Bible says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Let the little finger remind you to pray for yourself. So the next time you are talking to God and you can't think of anything to say, let the five-finger prayer help you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we know we are to talk to you and pray to you for things that we need or want in our lives. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what exactly to pray for, but let us use this five-finger prayer to remind us every day that these are the things that we should pray for in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ.
You've been there. Perhaps you're there right now. Something bothers you to the point that it it torments you. It it keeps you awake at night. It, It keeps you in constant contact with your limitations. It reminds you that indeed you live in an imperfect world. Maybe it even tortures you and impales you from time to time. This is known as a thorn in the flesh. Judah's king Hezekiah was there. Assyria's king Sennacherib and his mighty army draw closer to Jerusalem. Upon hearing the news, Hezekiah rips his clothes and puts on sackcloth, a symbol of mourning and anxiety, demonstrating that indeed a thorn in the flesh was present. But through the prophet Isaiah, God promises protection for Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah's thorn in the flesh becomes less intense. At least it does for the moment. King Sennacherib sends a letter to King Hezekiah. Don't let your God on whom you so naively lean deceive you, promising that Jerusalem will not fall at the hands of the king of Assyria. Use your head, man. Look around at what the kings of Assyria have done all over the world. One country after another devastated. And do you think you're going to get off? Have any of the other gods of these other lands ever stepped up and saved them? As the words of King Sennacherib's letter rings in Hezekiah's ears. The promise made by God begins to fade. In fact, Sennacherib's threatening letter torments Hezekiah. His fear and his anxiety resurface and thrust deeply into his spirit, torturing him, impaling him. So so how does Hezekiah respond to his thorn in the flesh? 
I invite you to turn in your Bibles or follow along on the screen as I read Isaiah chapter 37, verses 14 through 20. Hear now the word of God. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of His Holy Word. Unlike his father, King Ahaz, who made an alliance with the enemy, Hezekiah gets on his knees. On his knees, it symbolizes his weakness, his cry for mercy, as he spreads out the letter before the presence of God in the temple. On his knees, it symbolizes his humility. The recognition that he is small in the presence of God. The presence of the mighty creator and sustainer of heaven and earth. The God who alone is over all the kingdoms of the earth. On his knees. It's a posture of prayer. Pleading with God to become aware of the situation. Imploring God to take action. To fulfill the promise he made through the prophet Isaiah. In response to the torment caused by this thorn in the flesh, Hezekiah goes to the temple, gets on his knees, and seeks God's presence, God's power, and God's peace. And God responds. Through the prophet Isaiah, God reaffirms the promise made to deliver Jerusalem. In fact, if you Read on in this story, you discover that the next morning, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are found dead. King Sennacherib flees to Nineveh, and eventually two of his sons put him to the sword. Hezekiah's thorn in the flesh is no more, and they lived happily ever after. The end. But all stories don't end this way, do they? Like King Hezekiah, the Apostle Paul is tormented by a thorn in the flesh. Like Hezekiah, Paul gets on his knees in weakness and cries for mercy as he lays out the evidence of the severity of his thorn in the flesh. Like Hezekiah, Paul gets on his knees in humility, recognizing the all-powerful and all-merciful God. Like Hezekiah, Paul gets on his knees pleading with God to take notice, imploring God to take action. Yet unlike Hezekiah, Paul's thorn in the flesh remains. What are we to make of this? 
What are we to do after we have gotten on our knees and later realize that our thorn in the flesh remains? What are we to do when our terrible circumstances do not change? What are we to do when we interpret God's response to our heartfelt request as a not yet or a no? After we have sorted through the initial pain and grief of what we interpret to be God's silence or God's rejection of our request for relief, we may attempt to understand it all intellectually. For example, we may reason that God simply cannot say yes to every person who gets on his or her knees. You may have seen the 2003 movie, Bruce Almighty. The main character in the movie is uh, comedian uh, Jim Carrey. And he is given the power of God for an entire week. At first, he, he really enjoys his divinity. For example, he's having dinner out one night and he parts his tomato soup just like God through Moses parted the Red Sea. But soon he is inundated with millions of prayer requests via email. He's so overwhelmed that he sends a blanket reply yes to each prayer request. And it does not go well. Things begin to come crashing down in the world. For example, thousands and thousands of people had prayed to win the lottery. So they all do. But this causes the payout to be just a few dollars for each person. And therefore, each person becomes furious. And yes, this is a silly movie. But the movie does remind us that our prayers and God's answers to our prayers are a lot more complicated than God just indulging our every whim and removing our suffering. Theologically, we understand that we live in a world that has evil present. We live in a world where God has won the war through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, but battles still rage. We, we live in a world where good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. We we live in a world where God's purposes and the fulfillment of God's purposes may conflict with our desires and our perceived needs. Intellectually, we have come to understand this and we give a nod to the mystery that is present. But our mental understanding leaves us less than satisfied in the torment of of the thorn in our flesh that remains even after going to our knees. In the face of God's response of not yet or no, the truth is that we must remain on our knees. We must continue to maintain a posture of weakness, a posture of humility in the presence of our all-merciful and all-powerful Lord. And when we do, we soon discover a deeper reality, a truth that sustains us even when the thorn in the flesh is not taken away from us. The Lord's response to Paul while he was on his knees is the Lord's response to each of us. You see, God's answer is more than a casual not yet or no. God's answer is deep. My grace is sufficient for you. When we hear the the phrase, God's grace, we typically typically interpret it rather narrowly, don't we? 
we understand God's grace as God's free and unmerited favor that is manifest in our eternal salvation from sin and death through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We experience God's grace when we embrace Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And the opening line of our, one of our most beloved hymns rings in our ears. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. However, that, that same beloved hymn continues with lines like these. It speaks of a grace that relieves our fears. A grace that safely carries us through many dangers, toils, and snares. A grace that leads us home. You see, God's grace is also manifest in God's ongoing help. God's presence. God's power. God's peace in the midst of life. Which is especially important in those times when we feel tormented by thorns in the flesh. However, God's ongoing grace is similar to God's grace in and through Jesus Christ. It is a grace that is not forced upon us. It is a grace that we must embrace. In his book, Beyond Words, Christian theologian Frederick Beekner writes, The grace of God is something like this. Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. But there's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can be yours only if you reach out and take it. Maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift too. End of quote. In the face of God's perceived answer of not yet or no, we must remain on our knees. We must continue to maintain a posture of weakness and humility in the presence of our all-merciful and all-powerful Lord. You see, when we remain on our knees, we are open to receiving. Receiving a gift, the gift of God's grace. A grace that sustains us even when our thorn in the flesh is not taken away from us. A grace that God declares is sufficient for you. So how is God's grace sufficient for us even when we are dealing with thorns in the flesh. You see, on our knees, fully aware of our weaknesses, fully open in humility before God, God's grace begins to transform our perspective. God's grace begins to change our understanding about the thorn in the flesh. A transformation begins to occur as a thorn begins to resemble a rose. Our torment begins to uncover a gift. Our weakness and our humility begin to reveal God's strength. God declares to Paul and God declares to us, My grace is is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This transformation occurs on our knees, where we are open 
to receiving. You see, as we expose our thorns in the flesh to the Lord, as we continue to talk honestly and openly about our weaknesses and our sufferings and our struggles, we find strength as God's power and presence and peace wash over us. The thorn in the flesh is still present, but it is covered in the amazing grace of God. And this enables Paul to declare in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, I am strong. The story is told about a man who was driving down a country road and he lost control of his car and it ended up in a ditch. He spotted close by a, an old farmhouse and he walked to that farmhouse and talked to the owner. He asked him, Sir, do you have a, a tractor that I might borrow to pull my car out of the ditch? And the farmer said, nope, but I got my mule blue. The man doubted. He said, I, I don't think a mule's really going to pull my car out of the, the ditch. And the farmer responded, you don't know blue. Blue was hitched to the man's car. And the farmer called out, pull, Blue, pull. The car didn't move an inch. The farmer called out, pull, Elmer, pull. And the car began to move. The farmer called out, pull, Biscuit, pull. And the car came out of the ditch. Unbelievable. The man shook his head. He, he thanked the farmer profusely. But he had a question. How come you called that mule of yours by three different names? Simple, said the farmer. Blue is blind. And if he thought he was the only one pulling, your car would still be in the ditch. In the ditches of life, you don't have the power to transform your thorn in the flesh into a rose. You don't have the power alone to do so. However, on your knees, you will discover that you are not alone. God's presence, God's power, God's peace will transform you. Your weakness becomes strength. Your torment becomes a gift. Your thorn becomes a rose. Indeed, God's grace is sufficient. In the ditches of life, God may not remove your thorn in the flesh. God may not give you victory by lifting you out of your suffering. But God will give you victory by giving you sufficient grace in the midst of your suffering. But you can only receive it as a gift. A gift that is received on your knees. We move into our time where we offer our response to God. And I continue to be especially thankful and grateful for your faithfulness as you continue to send your offerings via electronically or through the mail to support the ministry of this community of faith. And I encourage you to continue doing so. However, I, I have an additional call to respond this morning. God's Word to us this morning calls us to recognize that weakness becomes strength on our knees when we are experiencing our own sense of humility. Humility isn't a trait that our nation celebrates. We like to see ourselves as a strong, 
nation, a a can-do culture, bursting at the seams with good ideas and good intentions and good results. Humility, on the other hand, suggests the aroma of helplessness. It's the quality that admits that there are things that we can't do, problems that we can't solve, forces that we can't control. And this cannot admission clashes terribly with our can-do arrogance. Look at the current thorns in the flesh of our nation. The coronavirus pandemic. The up and down economy which has cost people their jobs and shuttered businesses. The racial strife. The political divide. And the list can go on and on. I wonder how our current situation as a nation would have been different if our leaders and citizens would have responded not with arrogance, but with humility. You see, it is in our weaknesses that we discover strength. But alas, we continue to find our nation in the ditch with little forward movement. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is upon us to demonstrate a better way. God's Word promises grace. But God's grace must be embraced. And it is embraced when we are on our knees. Do you need God's grace today? For those of you who do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and perhaps you've stumbled across this broadcast today, do you recognize your need for God's grace? It is through His Son, Jesus Christ, that your sin can be removed and death can be no more. But you have to embrace it on your knees. It just takes a simple prayer. Perhaps you want to pray that prayer today. And we celebrate that decision. And we would love to hear about that decision. Please reach out to me and share it with me. But I suspect that the majority of people that are watching this today are already followers of Christ. But the question is still the same. Do you need God's grace? Are you experiencing, even in this moment, a thorn in the flesh or perhaps several thorns in the flesh? Well, you can respond by getting on your knees and opening yourselves up to receiving God's grace. God's grace is is indeed sufficient. So during this instrumental meditation, I invite you to reflect on your current situation. Allow any thorn in the flesh, any weakness or suffering, anything that is tormenting you, things that are keeping you awake at night, allow those things to intersect with the grace of God. Indeed, God's grace is enough.
Our song of response this morning is called Your Grace is Enough. Let's continue to worship. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your grace is all we need. Your grace is enough to cover our sin. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, as, as we, we learned about today, God, that the thorn in, the fle in our flesh is not meant to, uh, to define us, but it is meant to, to lead us um, to, to rely on you. And God, when we re rely upon you, um, we accept your grace, your mercy, your love. And Lord, it, that transforms us. When we open our hearts, uh, then true transformation can happen. So God, we pray that we don't just leave this time of worship just going about our day, but God, may we continue to worship you, continue to seek your presence, continue to be covered in your grace. And in doing so, Lord, we live out of that grace and we love people greatly and we make a difference in this world. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you go in peace. Amen.